Listen to this. That's the sound of a naturally aspirated V10 Formula One engine, a symphony of raw power that captivated and deafened anyone close enough to hear it. They pushed material science and engineering to its absolute limits and set a standard for performance that hasn't been matched by any production engine since, even 20 years later. Formula One engines are marvels of engineering. They've been on the limit of what's possible with internal combustion for as long as the sport's been around. Nowadays, under the current rules in Formula One, an engine has to last at least eight races. This is because over the course of a 23 race season, or the 24 races that are scheduled for next year in 2024, teams are only permitted to use three different engines over the course of a season. Use any more than that, and you get a penalty. Just ask Carlos Sainz, he knows all about it. Sorry for our fans. Vegas was amazing though. To get the level of performance that modern day Formula One cars are capable of, and to do it reliably, is an incredible engineering challenge, and one that would have been impossible for the teams to achieve just 20 years ago without making compromises. To be able to produce over a thousand horsepower from a 1.6 liter V6 revving over 10,000 RPM with hours spent at a time at full throttle and to be able to do it reliably week in and week out on the same engine pretty much without issue is a testament to the advances that have been made in design and manufacturing. You know what else is a 1.6 liter engine? Your grandma's Buick Excel. I mean a Honda Goldwing has more displacement than every Formula One car made in the past nine years. But as complicated, efficient, and reliable as the current day V6s are in Formula One, there was a day when sustainability was the last thing on anyone's mind. And it wasn't that long ago. If we go back 20 years to the 2003 Formula One season, what do we have? We have Michael Schumacher domination, groove tires, refueling, and we also had the V10s. And during 2003 and before this, an engine only had to be able to make it the whole race. Because you had effectively unlimited engines, it wasn't uncommon during this period for teams to run qualifying setups with their engines. Something that they would do in preparation for qualifying is tear the engine down and remove the second piston ring that was only there to help with oil consumption. This would allow them to make a little bit more power, but it would also burn a lot more oil because you wouldn't have as good of a seal between the piston and the cylinder wall. And after qualifying, they would tear everything back down, put that second ring back on the piston so that they could make it a whole race distance without using up all of their oil, and everyone was happy except the mechanics. It wouldn't be until the next year in 2004 when the Park Ferme rules started to show up and place limits on what work the teams could do to the engines during a weekend. Before that, it was basically a free-for-all. Well, this was true for the big teams with big budgets at least. Engines are expensive. The average race distance in Formula One in the early 2000s was 190 miles or 305 kilometers. This meant that while engineers were designing these engines, they only had to make sure that they were good enough to last 200 miles. And even though the V10s had gotten pretty reliable by this point, relative to how they used to be, they often still didn't make it to the finish line, relative to the engines that we use today. Many people will argue that the V10 era was the golden age of Formula One. The turbo V6s from the 80s were borderline uncontrollable, the V12s were horribly heavy and inefficient, and the modern V6s are still looked at as overpowered vacuum cleaners by people who are scared of hybrids and big cities. The V8s were great too. In the 2000s, Ferrari ran a naturally aspirated 3-liter V10 engine that often revved past 19,000 RPM, making as much as 920 horsepower, over 300 revolutions per second and over 300 horsepower per liter from a naturally aspirated engine. At the beginning of this video, I was talking about the V6 engines that Formula One cars are now required to run and the insane power that they're able to produce. They're much more advanced and, in my opinion, impressive than the V10s were. But it's important to remember that the modern day V6s are also turbocharged hybrids. To make the kind of power that the V10s were making without forced induction and without any electric support, like curves for the V8s or the hybrid components of the V6s, is a different kind of challenge. And that sound. Oh, that sound. Now this is great and all, but how were these engines able to make so much power in the first place? And why did they live such short lives? Well, the power that an engine makes is determined by its torque multiplied by its RPM. And you can increase power by doing a couple of different things. For example, you can burn more fuel and add more air by using some form of forced induction like a turbo. But the fuel flow is closely regulated in Formula One, as Ferrari found out in 2019, and turbos in the 90s and the early 2000s were banned. You can also increase power by increasing displacement. No replacement for displacement, so I'm told except for boost. Like in an old muscle car, you can create much bigger engines that run at much lower RPMs and make a lot more torque. However, in F1, as we already know, you have limits to the amount of displacement that your engine can have. So how much torque was the Ferrari V10 making? Well, look at it this way. I drive a Volkswagen Golf. The F2004, with its almost 1,000 horsepower, made four pound feet less torque than my Volkswagen. And you can calculate torque by taking the horsepower and multiplying it by 5252 divided by your RPM, which for the Ferrari gives us 200 
154 pound-feet of torque. Because of these limits on displacements, they couldn't just make a bigger engine that makes loads of torque, and so the engineers decided that the best way to make more power would be to just turn it faster. Higher RPMs, baby. More revs, more revolutions, more power. And the reason these engines were able to run at 19,000 RPM for hours at a time is because of their small displacements and their very short stroke length. In my car, the pistons have to move up and down quite a long way. But in Formula One, that distance is a lot shorter. And because that three liter displacement is divided between 10 different cylinders, the bore size can be quite small as well. So you have super light pistons that only have to move a little more than an inch, meaning they can go really fast. Most of the V10s of this era had a stroke length that was less than 40 millimeters, which is around an inch and a half. You also have a valve train that's being powered by pneumatics, because at these speeds, the springs wouldn't be able to move the valve back into its closed position by the time it had to open again. You had finely tuned harmonics inside of the engine to make sure that they don't shake themselves apart, and the engineers had to reinforce the piston rings because they were fluttering too much at these high speeds. These engines were also made with such high tolerances that when they're not up to operating temperature, they're almost seized in place. If you put a regular starter motor on an F1 car, it probably wouldn't be able to move the crank at all. To get around this, engineers had to come up with a way to artificially heat up the engine before startup. And the solution that they came to was to plug what is effectively a preheater to the coolant system, which pumps hot coolant throughout the engine to heat everything up to the very narrow operating window that the engine is designed to run in. My fiance's Ford Fusion will start up if we're in the middle of a blizzard, and it'll start up if we're in the middle of a desert. This is because of special low viscosity oils, as well as engineering tolerances that allow everything to move freely inside of the cylinder regardless of thermal expansion. But in F1, everything is machined to such tight tolerances that before they get up to temp, the pistons aren't even completely round. They're actually very slightly oval shaped and they're engineered to become perfectly round once they go through thermal expansion and get up to temperature. These are the tolerances that the engineers were working with when they were designing these engines. And most of this is still true even with today's engines. But in the early 2000s, like we already said, there was no need for an engine to last more than a couple hundred miles. The engine inside of a Toyota Camry can run for hundreds of thousands of miles because it's built to do so. It has a wide operating window and has a usable power band for everyday use. It's fuel efficient, quiet, and smooth. This is none of those things. The only thing teams are worried about when creating an engine like this is making as much power as possible within the rules. So when you find yourself wondering why old race car engines don't last very long, that's kind of your answer. They're designed to very tight tolerances and they're pushed to their absolute limits, which means that they come out of tolerance very quickly. Let's look at a lap like Spa, which is a four mile circuit, so one of the longest on the F1 calendar. Over 72% of this lap is spent at full throttle. Monza is even worse, where you spend 76% of your lap with your foot all the way to the floor. This sustained super high RPM puts a tremendous amount of wear on the components inside of the engine. They ran right to the edge of failure. The tiniest fault or misalignment of a part due to wear will immediately domino throughout the rest of the system, which will be disastrous. Let me give an example of just how much life higher RPM takes out of an engine. If we take a look at the Cosworth BP-01 Champ car, the engine that it uses typically has a lifespan of around 400 miles or so, for a lot of the same reasons that we already discussed. To try and cut down on costs, the engineers wanted to find a way to cut down on the wear and tear inside of the engine, so they decided to do an experiment where they dropped the red line from 16,000 down to 12,000. This tripled the life of the engine. The V6 hybrids used by Formula One today are able to last as long as they do because of advances in oils, lubricants, manufacturing, and the materials that are used. And if the rules during the early 2000s said that the engines needed to last eight races like they do today, it would probably be possible to make the V10s do it, but they wouldn't be doing it at 19,000 RPM. That's for sure. If they ran longer than one race, they would have to lower the revs and sacrifice more performance in the name of reliability. Makes you wonder what the V6s they use today would be capable of if they threw out the rulebook. Of course, this is nothing compared to the engines that are used in dragsters, which need rebuilt after every run, but maybe that's an idea for another video.